Over a million men from undivided India served in the First World War, voyaging to the heart of whiteness, Europe, and beyond to Mesopotamia, East Africa, Gallipoli, and Egypt. We often forget that these men did not just fight or labor, but lived, loved, felt dawn, and saw sunset glow. These men encountered new lands, met women and children, and shivered as shells blew around them. And I realized that a cultural and literary history is the only way to cover the texture of their experience, recover their humanity. One of my great uncles served as a doctor in France, and his own brother, who became a revolutionary nationalist, was beaten to death in presidency jail in Kolkata. So these are contested histories. These are contradictory histories. And I've tried to let the sources argue amongst themselves in order to understand the complexity. Most of the soldiers were non-literate or semi-literate. And therefore, it is absolutely essential to go beyond the written and the official documents into objects, images, paintings, photographs, sound recordings, letters, and literary material in order to understand what I call echoes of the sepoy heart. And often a fugitive fragment can unlock a whole world. Like I remember coming across these bloodstained glasses in a little archive just outside Calcutta. And further research revealed that they belonged to Jogensen, who was the only non-white member of the Leeds Pals Battalion. Or if we consider this letter written by a very young girl from Punjab, writing to her dad serving in Egypt, saying she's learning how to read and write so that she can read his letters. And then you realize that the Punjabi home front and the war front in Egypt are not all that far apart. And you can put that in dialogue with this desolate sound recording I heard in the Humboldt archives by this Indian prisoner of war, Mal Singh, pining to go back home. So you have the stories of these two people from different parts of the world, separated by war, war and trying to communicate. I think it's important to de-Europeanize our research methodology as well as our sources and also know what questions to ask of our research material the moment we step outside Europe. During my research, I was struck time and again by the sheer richness of the literary material from reminiscences by a Parsi soldier who took part in the Somme, or something as remarkable as this book, Abhile Baghdad, written by a Bengali prisoner of war in Mesopotamia. And I think this matches up to the best writings of Sassoon or Edmund Blunden, to the writings of Rabindranath Tagore, Iqbal, Kaji Nojul Islam, to novels such as Mulk Rajanan's Across the Black Waters, in a context where the testimonial sources are so fragmentary, literature, I think, fills in the gaps of history and provides insights into the inner tumultuous world of feeling. And that's what I tried to capture in this book. The literature in the book is also a mode of reading. The censored letters of the soldiers are often extracted, but seldom read. Let's read a couple. There is conflagration all around, and you must imagine it to be a dry forest in a high wind in the hot weather, or as tired bullocks and bull buffaloes lie in the month of Bhado, so lies the weary world. Our hearts are breaking. And these letters were written by Indian soldiers serving in France, and they are, I contend, the Indian literature of the trenches. For these men may be non-literate, but they are intensely literary, expressing themselves through images, metaphors, similes, 
rooted in the robust oral culture of Punjab. One of the most important legacies of the centennial years would be the greater recognition of colonial non-white soldiers, much needed. At the same time, there's a sanitization of these memories. These poor soldiers are often turned into colonial heroes, as if bravery is the only ticket for remembrance. And commemoration slips into celebration. But these are unattractive histories. These are painful histories. These are traumatic histories. One should have the honesty and the integrity to look at these messy histories squarely in the eye and try to understand, not glorify them. Now, I think that in 2018, we need to go beyond just commemoration. It's not enough just to remember, but how we remember, who we remember, and what we remember.